Welcome to the lesson on big O notation. So this notation specifies the asymptotic complexity, which basically estimates how fast a certain function grows. So basically, as we increase the input of the function, as we increase n in our case, how fast is the change in, in f, the function value? So definition one, fn is big O of gn, if there exist a positive numbers um, C and N such that Fn is smaller than or equal to Cgn for all N greater than or equal capital N. Now, what does that mean in simple English? We have function G of N when we multiply it by a certain constant C. This function is always going to be bigger or equal to Fn for some specific values of N that are larger than or equal to a threshold in capital. Now, example, we have to find C and N to show that this function Fn, 2n squared plus 3n plus 1, is big O n squared. So from the definition in the previous slide, Fn is the function and Gn is n squared. So Gn here is just n squared. Now, we will write down the definition, of the big O notation, so the function will be smaller than or equal to c of n square for certain values of n. Now, how do you find um, the threshold in capital and c? We are going to divide all terms by n square. Then we are going to substitute any value um, for n and calculate the resulting c. So basically what I am saying is there are infinitely many pair of c and n now one example of a solution is we can set n to be one and c will be six so what does that mean is um, six n square will be always greater than or equal to this function on the left uh, when n is greater than or equal to to one similarly there are other solutions other possible c's and possible n's now, this is um, even expanding the number of solution. So as we have more Ns, as we increase N, the threshold, we can have different Cs. Now we just need one bear to prove that um, a certain function is big O of another function. Okay, now in this we visualize the original function Fn which is 2n squared plus 3n plus 1, we visualize it alongside all possible um, c n squared that we basically extracted from this calculation. So here we have c n squared with different values of c. For example, the one we discussed is 6 n squared. We are drawing all these functions, and we can notice that for larger values of n, the cn square function is bigger than the original function. For example, um, after n equal 1 or at n equal 1, we notice that 6n square will be bigger than the original function, which is basically the definition of the big O notation, that um, for certain values of n above a threshold, the value of the function will be greater than the value of the original function. Now, we can classify algorithms by the time and space complexity. Now, we talked about time complexity, just a small clarification about space complexity. What we mean by space complexity is the extra amount of memory that is required to run the algorithm. So we don't care or we don't calculate the input size um, as, uh, as a factor in space complexity. We just care about the extra amount of storage. So for example, if the algorithm will receive an array of size n and it needs to copy this array two times in order to process it, then the complexity, the space complexity of this algorithm will be 2, 2 n. Uh, however, we can have a constant space complexity when the algorithm will use the same amount of memory regardless of the input size. 
So for example, if the algorithm is just creating three variables each time it executes, regardless of the input size, then this algorithm has a constant execution space. Similarly, we can have a constant execution time, which means the algorithm will take the same amount of time, regardless of the size of the input. And in both these cases, constant execution time or constant space complexity, we represent uh, the complexity by the term big O of one. So one here just means a constant, not necessarily the number one. Now, this what we mean by constant complexity. Uh, another example of complexity is quadratic complexity. Uh, this is the case when the execution time is big O of n square. Um, now, what does that mean is if we can represent the time that the function will take or the algorithm will take as a function, then we figure out what is the big O of this function. And that big O was n square. Then we say that the original algorithm is quadratic. Now we will see the amount of time taken for a hypothetical situation. So assume we have a computer that run one instruction. You can think about this instruction as a basic operation, one instruction per microsecond. And we will compare the amount of time, the amount of mic microseconds that will be taken for different input size, different n, that is the x-axis here, and different different uh, complexity of an algorithm. So we will talk about a constant time algorithm, algorithmic algorithm, and so on. So when we have a constant time algorithm, so the algorithm will perform the same amount of operation regardless of the input size. Notice how the number of operation, the number of operation will be the same even if we change the input size. So the input size here is 10, 100, and 1,000. We always have one as the number of operation. And since we have one operation, it will take one microsecond. Now, when we have a logarithmic algorithm, so the complexity of the algorithm is logarithmic, big O of log n, and we have 10 operations or 10 instructions, sorry, we have 10 input size, we will perform log n or log 10 of, um, of the input size, and this will be the number of operation we will perform and it will take approximately three microseconds. Now, a small note here, whenever you see LG, whenever we write the log as LG, um, we usually mean base two, okay? And for the case of linear algorithm, now the number of operation will be just equal to the number of input size. So for 100 over, um, input size, we will therefore 100 operation, and it will take 100 microseconds. Now, why are we showing this table here? We would like to get an appreciation of how a small difference in the input size might lead to a big difference in the execution time. Let's see an example. If you have an exponential algorithm, like in the last row here, and you have an input size of 10, it will take 10 milliseconds to finish it, the algorithm to finish execution. However, if we just multiply the number of um, input by 10, and we have 100 input, um, size, then it will take three times 10 to the power 17 years for the algorithm to finish. Now, one more example about how a small difference can make a big difference in time. See that um, if we have a quadratic algorithm and the input size is 10 to the power four, then it will take 1.7 minutes. However, if we have a cubic algorithm, so the complexity difference here is just by one power. However, it will take from 1.7 minutes to 11.6 days. So an algorithm that is quadratic is very much better than an algorithm that is cubic, even for a smaller um, size input. Okay, now we have the classes of complexities here, examples of complexities visualized. So each function is just drawn. And we can see that as we increase n, in our case, the input size, how fast is the increase in the time? 
or the value of the function basically. So we can see that in cube is growing faster than log n and faster than n. We can see that n log n is between n square and n. This is this um, graph is very helpful in deciding which functions or which algorithm are better than um, the others in terms of complexity. So we will introduce some properties of peak annotation. The first one is uh, transitivity. So if we have Fn, big O, uh, Fn is big O of Gn, and Gn is big O of Hn, then the first function Fn is big O of Hn. Now, how is that possible? We can simply find C1 and N1 um, such that if n is smaller than c1 g n, this is from the definition of the big annotation. And similarly, we will find c2 and n2 such that g n is less than or equal to c2 h n. Um, sorry, g n is less than or equal c2 h n. And if we have both um, c1 and c2, n1 and n2, then we can show that if n is smaller than or equal the multiplication of the c's times hn for all n greater than or equal to the maximum of the n's. So from the last statement here, we can show that fn is in fact big O of hn because we have a c for that, which is c1 times c2, and an n for that, which is the maximum of n1 and n2. Fact two is if fn is big O of Hn and Gn is big O of Hn. So we have two functions that share the same big O. Now, in this case, if we sum up the functions, the big O of the sum is still Hn. Fact three, the function A times n to power k. Now, A here is just a constant. This function is big O of nk. So basically, you can discard the constant in the big O term. Um, the function in k, fact four, the function n to power k is big O of n to power k plus some positive number. Now, to have an appreciation of this fact, you can think about n to power three being big O of n to power four. You can find c and n such that this is true. What we are saying here is n4 will be always larger than n3 for specific values of n. Now, the last uh, fact, fact five, if, um, if n is equal to c g n, so basically the function if n is a constant time another function, then if n is just big O of g of n. So whenever C is a constant, you can say that Fn is big O of Gn. Fact six, if Fn equal to a summation of two functions, then we say Fn is big O of the maximum of both these two functions. For example, um, if we have Fn to be n square plus 100n, then we can pick n square here to be the maximum. Um, such that if n is big O of n square. Fact seven, if f n is equal to g n times h n, then f n is big O of the multiplication. So when the function is a multiplication of two functions, then this function itself, f n, is big O of that multiplication. Uh, you can see the proof uh, in the textbook uh, for all of these facts. But what's important for us here is to know how to determine the big O of any function given these properties. Fact eight, we say the function um, log base A of N is big O of log base B of N for any positive number A and B above one. So what, what I'm saying here basically is the log function will grow with the same rate regardless of the base. So you can say that log A of N is big O of log B of N or the opposite, it is still true. Now this might seem a little bit strange, but you can 
show with a little bit of um, algebra and arithmetic that log base a of n is equal to c, a constant c, times log b of n, where c is simply ln of b over ln of a. And since we can show this um, fact right here, we can use fact 5 from the previous slides to conclude that log a of n is big O of log b of n, because c is just a constant. Fact 9, we have log a of n is big O of log base 2 of n for any positive number a above 1. Now, this is just um, a straightforward result from fact 8. It's just a special case from fact 8. Now, we will discuss um, notations that are similar to big O, which are big. Uh, we'll start by big uh, omega. So we say that the function fn is big omega of g of n if there exist a positive, uh, positive number c and n such that fn is greater than or equal to cgn for all n above or equal to capital N. Now, the only difference between this definition and the definition of the big O notation is the direction of the inequality. So for big O, g of n will be larger. For big omega, f of n will be larger. Now, what we, um, what we notice or what we conclude from these two definition, uh, there is interconnection between these two notation which is uh, expressed by the equivalence right here. So we say that Fn is big omega of uh, Gn if and only if Gn is big O of Fn. So what I'm saying is the big omega of Fn is Gn. If this is the case, then you can say that Gn has a big O, which is Fn. Now, lastly, the last notation we'll introduce is big theta. Now, big theta will have two sets of, or two Cs, basically. So we say that Fn is big theta of Gn, if there exist positive numbers C1, C2, and capital N, such that Fn is between C1, Gn, and C2, Gn. So, if you think about the graphs we shown earlier for big O, we will have two curves or two graphs, C1, Gn, and C2, Gn, that are rubbing or surrounding Fn for values of n that are larger than a specific threshold. So uh, just a word of um, caution here when applying any of these notations. Remember, they are approximation. So um, any big O or big theta or big omega are approximating the original function, which means they hide some details that might be important in some situation. That's it for this lesson, and I will see you in the next one.